enhancing our canary payload for the USB rubber ducky and answers to your questions on SMB servers and keyboard lock states. For Hack 5, I'm Darren Kitchen, this is Payload. Previously, I wrote a payload for the USB rubber ducky that Glitch had implanted inside of a modded mouse and its objective was quite simple. It was to trigger an SMB canary when the user was logged in. Today, we're gonna to take that payload to the next level and implement a few choice tweaks and ideas from you guys in the comments. Now, our existing payload injects an incredibly small amount of keystrokes, causing our target Windows box to connect to a malicious SMB share on the network. That shared folder is what's known in the industry as a canary, kind of the proverbial canary in a coal mine. The idea there is on the defensive side, it serves as a sort of early warning system for network breaches. It's basically a decoy or a honeypot that we can set up to mimic sensitive data. And then that way we can actually, you know, see when it's accessed and then alert the security team. So for our mock red team engagement, we're actually going to be using this as proof that a box got popped with our USB rubber ducky. And there are a ton of different ways that we can actually trigger a canary. For example, you could load a web page over HTTP. Shannon and I actually did this years ago by planting dozens of USB rubber duckies at a security conference. They were loaded with a payload that would actually hit a web server we control and that web server would log the IP address and information about the target's browser from the user agent field. Now, for our canary today, I've decided to use SMB, or Server Message Block Protocol. It's a mostly Windows-centric protocol for file sharing and printer sharing, and it's been around for ages. What's cool about it is it gives us, the attacker, not just the target's IP address, but the host name of the computer, the name of the logged-in user, and an NTLM hash if we're so inclined to try cracking the password. Back to our payload. What's unique about this is instead of doing like a drive-by attack where we've got just a few seconds of physical access to an unlocked machine, we're assuming the computer's locked. We're either planting the USB rubber ducky on the computer ourselves or tricking the user into plugging it in for us. So for the latter, implanting the USB rubber ducky inside of a modded mouse and shipping bunches of those to an IT department isn't a terrible way to go. I mean, we've definitely heard anecdotally a bunch of friends on the red teams that have done this successfully. Uh, they'll eventually get plugged in. Honestly, what I love doing is just writing something enticing on the drive label itself, making it work as an actual flash drive in the payload and then your additional keystroke injection later on. And then you just basically let human curiosity run its course. Now our payload is able to pull off the canary trigger while presumably the user is logged in and active by using a unique method of detection. It starts by ensuring that the caps lock is turned on and then it waits for the user to turn it off by pressing the caps lock key. It does this twice with a long configurable delay in between which lets us safely assume that they're past the windows lock screen. Once they press the caps lock for the second time, which the USB rubber ducky can detect, then there's a good bet that they're logged in and actively using the computer. That's when our SMB keystrokes are injected in just a split second and we get some loot on our pen test box. So today, we're gonna enhance this payload. First, by locking the computer that we're planting the USB rubber ducky on, which will add a little bit of reliability to our payload. Then we're gonna make sure that it only ever runs once, even if the computer reboots. And finally, we're gonna add some obfuscation to make the payload even stealthier. So I'm in Payload Studio here, let's dive in. I wanna start by cleaning up this payload. This is the previous one, and I actually noted a, a mistake that I had made when the video dropped, which is the extension twice here. It's not a super big deal, Payload Studio will still compile it, but it is syntactically incorrect. Same thing here for my if. I actually don't have a then right here. There should be a then after if. Again, it still compiles, but it's really best practice. Also, I kind of want to get everything outside of this if the you know OS is Windows kind of situation. 
What we're doing here is we're setting up as an attack mode to mimic the vendor ID and product ID and all of the other stuff of uh, you know, a Logitech mouse and we're detecting passively if it's a Windows box and then we're only executing this stuff if it's Windows. So if it's not Windows, then it's gonna fall through and just go to attack mode off. Let's actually make this a little better. I'm just gonna go ahead and get rid of this if and if uh, and uh, and if right there and just select all this and kind of shift tab it to bring it back. And what we'll do instead right here is say, uh, we'll do, start with the remark and the payload if it isn't Windows. Because we've already gone ahead and detected it here inside this extension, which we can open up and we can see the usage and kind of how that works in an example. What's really fun here is we can just do an if statement and say if, and then we can add another parentheses and say, the OS, so that variable that gets populated with Windows or Linux or Mac or whatever it is, if Windows, right, which evaluates to true in this case, if it is indeed a Windows box, is false, right, then, and we'll end our if, then this is gonna happen. So what's gonna happen? Well, let's just do attack mode off. So disables the USB rubber ducky completely and then stop underscore payload. And you know what? We can also get a little crafty here and do hide underscore payload. And what that's going to do is it'll actually delete the inject.bin file off the USB rubber ducky's storage. So if it's a later investigated, forensic analysis, all that stuff, they're not going to find the payload as easily. And also, if you unplug the USB rubber ducky, plug it back in, or say it's planted inside of a mouse and the computer reboots, that's gonna power cycle that device and then this payload would have kicked off again. By doing hide underscore payload and then not actually bringing that payload back anytime later on in this payload, we've essentially destroyed the uh, inject.bin file, which is the file that instructs the USB rubber ducky what to do. And that's kind of neutered it here. And it also means that we've trapped anything that isn't Windows right here. So basically everything past this little block of code isn't going to run. Another thing that I kind of thought about in reviewing the last episode was that I do this caps lock dance twice as it were, right? So we check to see if caps lock isn't on and if it isn't, then we turn it on by pressing caps lock and then we wait for a change. Well, it would be better if we always did this instead of just blindly hitting caps lock later on after our delay. So to reuse this code and not have to type it twice, I'm gonna go ahead and just wrap all of this inside of a function. We'll get our indentation going and we'll do function and we're gonna call this trigger caps. And then we'll end our function right down here. And now whenever we wanna use this, all we have to do is do trigger underscore caps and we can see it auto completes there. And then this, whenever we use this on our payload, we'll essentially run the contents of this. So now I can get rid of all this stuff and say, okay, great. So we've done our trigger caps and then we'll do trigger caps again and then we're gonna go ahead and inject our fun keystrokes. So uh, another thing that I thought about was, we're gonna assume that when we plant this on a target, it's a locked computer, but what if it isn't? We've got that unnecessary caps lock twice with our delay, and that's really to ensure that, hey, if they're at the lock screen, we're not gonna go ahead and try to inject some keystrokes. Well, we can just like make sure that happens by quite simply right after our little, uh, you know, if, hey, if it's uh, not Windows, kill the payload, right? And then we've got our function. Uh, let's go ahead and invoke the lock screen by doing GUI, which is just abbreviation for the super key or the Windows key, uh, and then L. So GUI L on a Windows box is just gonna lock the screen. So GUI L, that's gonna lock the screen. And then at that point, we can do it, go ahead and trigger a caps lock, wait for our delay. Remember our delay, is using a define up here. So this is actually going to delay for 60 seconds-ish. I'm actually gonna make this like, I don't know, 10 seconds just for our demo purposes here. And then let's come down here. And next thing we're gonna need to do is say, all right, cool. Well, if after we've done the trigger caps lock and they've pressed the caps lock key here, we wanna go ahead and actually like inject our keystrokes that are gonna hit us on the share. What if we could make this a little bit less obvious to the user? Yes, as we currently have it, we're only injecting like 
I don't know, 10 to 20 keystrokes uh, doing this string line in the run dialog. However, it will actually pop up a window uh, on our actual Samba share. And that might actually be helpful on our pen test. We could actually name that Samba share something enticing and, uh, and add some malicious files in there, like call it, ooh, human resources, payroll data, and you know have an exe or whatever. But we also might want it to be super quick, super simple, and leave nothing on the screen. As it currently stands, we wait for two seconds and then hit Alt F4 to close that window. It's kind of blind. It's not terrible but we could do it better with a little bit of obfuscation. So what I wanna do is not just hard code this payload with the obfuscation. It really depends on your you know, use case for your engagement. So I wanna make this payload really flexible. In that case, let's come right back up here where we've got our defines and create a new one called obfuscation. So we'll do define and we're gonna call it pound obfuscate. And you know what? By default, let's leave it as false. But if you wanna make this payload obfuscated, you would just change this to true. Then we can just wrap our obfuscation true, our obfuscation code inside of a uh, little if statement down here. So after it's happened, let's see, we're gonna do our standard Windows key R, bring up the uh, Windows run dialog, wait for half a second, that sounds good. And this is the point at which we actually choose whether or not we're gonna run the obfuscated code or not. So quite simply, we'll do an if, and I'll go ahead and actually do an if else. Yeah, and you'll notice that we actually get, you know, all of these little snippets, which is great because if we, you know, want to be lazy, you know, do an if else or an if else if or all sorts of these, uh, we can just hit enter and then there we go. It actually prompts us, hey, put in a condition here and then put in the code. So I'm going to do exactly that. And in this case, the condition is just going to be that uh, pound obfuscate that we defined. So pound obfuscate, and the cool thing is that is just gonna evaluate whether or not this is true. So basically it's the equivalent to saying if true. And as we know up here, we actually said it's false. So what'll happen is this block of code will run if it's true and this block of code will run if it's false. So in that case, let's yeet over our um, non-obfuscated code to the else and then for the obfuscated code, what I wanna do is a string line and we're gonna do CMD, so run the command prompt, CMD, slash capital C. The capital C is going to tell the command prompt to close when it's done running the command. Now, what command are we gonna run? Well, this is fun. Inside of a set of quotation marks, we're going to run our command, which is going to begin with the start command. So Start is a command that allows you to run other programs within Windows with various different parameters. And one of the parameters is to have that program start minimized with slash min. You could similarly run it maximized with slash max. So what that means is this first command prompt is going to invoke a second command prompt that is minimized. And when it's done running that minimized command prompt, it's gonna close its window. And that's gonna happen in the blink of an eye. So what is that actual command that's minimized gonna run? Well, it's gonna run CMD because we wanna actually pass a command to the old school Windows command prompt and we're gonna leverage its ability to access SMB shares. And of course, we're gonna tell that one to close as soon as it's done as well. So what is the final actual command that's gonna be run in this nested, minimized, obfuscated command prompt? Well, it's quite simply gonna be backslash backslash and in this case, the host name or IP address of our SMB, which we have defined right here as SMB path. So I'm gonna go ahead and say backslash backslash pound, oh, I didn't do pound, hang on, pound SMB path. By the way, that's important because this is gonna say, hey, that's a define, right? Uh, whereas if I actually didn't have that, it would literally type backslash backslash SMB underscore path, which isn't what we want. So by doing that pound, it's gonna say, hey, go to backslash, backslash, whatever was defined earlier in this payload. In fact, if we hover over uh, this little thing in Payload Studio, 
And it'll actually say that the SMB path modifies this to whatever we had previously, and we can see it actually shows as 192.168, in my case, 86.62. That's gonna be different based on whatever your environment is. And then this way, it's much easier for someone to reuse this payload because right here at the top of the payload is a big chunk of defines where they know like, oh, these are the things, these are the parameters that I need to set for my payload to make it specific for my engagement. Now, uh, one other thing that we are going to have to add in this case, because we're using the old school command prompt in Windows and it isn't going to love just doing backslash backslash a host name or an IP address to open a Windows share. It actually wants to know not just the name of the computer or the IP address, but also the name of the share or the directory of the share. Uh, otherwise it's gonna error out, not even make that connection. So let's go ahead and we're in this case going to need another define for the SMB directory. So we'll call that pound SMB underscore dir for directory. And this could be whatever you want, share or leet files or <laughs> secret data or whatever enticing you want because the user is gonna eventually see this if you leave it open. Um, and in that case, I actually make it one letter. I make it A because that makes it much quicker to inject. Fewer keystrokes, the better, right? So now we just come down here to our SMB path and we do backslash backslash the SMB path backslash pound SMB underscore. And you'll see here that it's gonna auto complete directory. There we go, hooray, Bob's your uncle. Now what's gonna happen is after it, you know, so we walk through the whole payload, right? So we set our attack mode to mimic the mouse. We passively detect if it's Windows. If it's not Windows, we're gonna go ahead and kill the attack mode. We're going to hide the payload. We're gonna stop the payload. It's dead. If that didn't happen, it's gonna continue and we make a function here called trigger caps that detects whether or not caps lock is on. And if it isn't, it will press the caps lock key and then wait for the user to press the actual physical caps lock key, which we can detect as the USB rubber ducky, and then we can reuse this function. So we start by then locking the, wind, uh, the Windows you know, computer there, going to the lock screen with Windows key L. We go ahead and do that function where it waits for the user to press caps lock after we've enabled it. We do our delay, we do that once more, and that's when we actually do the nefarious triggering our uh, canary here. So that's where we get to the Windows key R, and then once the Windows Run dialog is open, that's when our payload is going to make that decision. If obfuscate, then. So in this case, if false, well, if false, it's gonna to go to else. But if we set this obfuscate to true up here in our payload, and let's do that for the demo, true, then if true, well, if true is always going to yield true, <laughs> that's one equals one, right? So uh, if true, then it's gonna go ahead and run this string line. So it's gonna inject that string of commands and hit enter, because we did string ln instead of just string. Uh, and there we go. It's gonna you know, fall through the rest of the if. And now we're at the end of our payload. And similar to if this wasn't a Windows machine, we also want to go ahead and kill this payload. Now, last time we just did attack mode off, but I also want to do hide underscore payload. Right, and then there you go, hide the payload. So that inject.bin file will be removed and then we turn attack mode off and then we're pretty much done. I mean, we can do stop underscore payload, but hey, we're at the very end of the script. That's, that's inherent, it's going to end, but that's it. So let's go ahead and give this a shot. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in my USB rubber ducky here. And I've got this one currently loaded with another payload. So I'm gonna do the squeeze to go ahead and get it to uh, go into arming mode for me. And so now it is just a regular benign flash drive. I'm gonna hit generate payload. I'm going to save this payload as inject. And remember here, it's gotta be inject.bin. So none of this, you know, parentheses one stuff, right? So we're gonna go ahead and overwrite the existing file. Yeah, replace that. Payload Studio goes ahead and saves that. We're safe to eject. We're just gonna unplug that guy. And now let's come over to our Windows box and go ahead and deploy this. Now, 
um, as you know from last time, we actually have a uh, listener set up here. So we've got our Samba listener. And now if we take a look at our Windows box, which is currently logged in at the desktop, let's plug in our USB rubber ducky. Same thing would work if this was implanted inside of a mouse. I'm gonna go ahead and plug that in there. It locks the computer. And I'll notice that the caps lock is actually on. So you can see that light right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and log in. So go ahead and type in, oh no, hey, I can't log in because guess what? Password's incorrect because caps lock was on. And then as a user, I'm like, oh, right, caps lock's on. So I'm gonna press it to turn it off, type in my password, hooray, I'm at the Windows desktop. Now I can go ahead and work. I'm a fun little worker bee. So at this point, it is doing our you know, wait for 10 seconds thing. And in just a moment, it's gonna go ahead and inject those keystrokes uh, from our payload. <laughs> I'm actually duped by my own payload. I'm, I'm patiently here waiting for the demo to go and then I realize, oh right, it's waiting on me to trigger it. Uh, so I look again and now caps lock has been enabled again. Oops, let's go ahead and press caps lock to disable that and there goes our obfuscated payload. It happened in the blink of an eye and there's nothing left open on our screen. But if we take a look at our Linux box, hooray! We actually have all sorts of information here on our target computer. We've got the, uh, you know, the name of the computer, the logged in user, the hash, the IP address, and of course we like have the timestamp so we know who did it, when, where, with the candlestick in the library. That's right, Colonel Mustard, I know it was you. Now let's wrap up by answering a few questions from the comments, one of which was about using NumLock instead of Caps Lock as the trigger for our payload. Some have pointed out that their laptop doesn't have a NumLock key, so would that work? Quite simply, yes. All PCs, whether they have the key on their keyboard or not, support three lock states, which are Caps Lock, NumLock, and Scroll Lock. Uh, props in the comments if you know what that was originally for. And if we run this uh, simple payload, let's go ahead and just demo a payload here. We'll actually see this in action. So let me just, you know, control, uh, command A, get rid of all of that. Let's do a, a fun little experiment here. We'll do while true. And inside of our infinite loop, we're gonna do caps lock. And then we'll do num lock. And then we'll do scroll lock. And then we're going to wait 100 milliseconds. Cool. Let's go ahead and inject this payload. Pop in our USB rubber ducky. I've done the button mod, so let's go ahead and squeeze to get that into arming mode. Generate payload. Save that on our USB rubber ducky as inject. And notice this time when I went to save it as inject, it wasn't like inject parentheses one because the inject.bin file was removed at the end of our payload, which is pretty cool. Uh, now let's go ahead and unplug this and pop this on our little windows box over here. I'm gonna move this over so you can see the lock key on the keyboard and plug this in right here. And immediately you see that this key is indeed blinking like crazy, right? But there's no num lock or scroll lock key on this. However, what's really cool is if I actually grab a regular old PC 104 keyboard here, and this one happens to be from Lenovo, but they're all the same essentially. I'm gonna go ahead and plug this into our box and take a look at the LEDs there. In fact, I'll try to scooch this over so we can see both the uh, both the built-in caps lock and as I plug this in, there we go. Now we have our num lock, scroll lock, and caps lock keys going. Oh, and it's an interesting pattern here. Just because of the way I uh, plugged it in, I plugged it in while caps lock was on. So if I plug this in again, yeah, okay. The race condition, this is gonna be fun. Can I get it? Nope, I literally have to plug it in right as it's not on. Ah, 
I can't get it. But you get the idea, it's like in between cycles. And so every time you're injecting, you know, caps lock or scroll lock or num lock, that is being sent to all of the keyboards connected to that computer, including the USB rubber ducky, which can detect whether or not that's been pressed, which we can do all sorts of fun things with, as we've just demonstrated now, detecting if the user is indeed present. So even though you don't have a numlock key on your laptop, it exists, it's right there. Uh, and I feel like in this kind of like social engineering context, caps lock is the best one to press because if they're like in a Word doc or in an email and they're typing and then suddenly they're in like cruise control for cool caps lock, they're like, ah, crap. And they're just gonna instinctively press the key and that's when, hooray, blink of an eye, our obfuscated payload's gonna run or not obfuscated, it's your choice in the payload. And lastly, setting up the SMB listener for our Canary is just a matter of running an SMB server utility by Impacket on our Linux box here, which in my case is Kali. The command that I use right here, if I just go ahead and command control C this and go up, you'll see is Impacket SMB server, TAC SMB2 support, and the reason for that is there, it will default to SMB version one, which modern Windows boxes will pop up a uh, security warning if it's that version. So we definitely wanna do SMB v2, and then TAC IP, and that will be the IP address of your particular computer, or you know th this, th this listener that's on the network. Uh, and then you'll follow that with the name of the share, the thing that we were talking about earlier when we defined uh, the SMB underscore DIR, that in my case is the letter A, or you could make it something enticing, uh, and then a path to somewhere on that machine that is hosting some files. I, for this demo, made that slash TMP, so nothing exciting in there, but if you wanted to, you could populate that with all sorts of nefarious, malicious, whatever have you documents, and then you could configure the payload to leave that open so they're like, ooh, what did I just get to, huh? So that's all I have for this follow-up. What are your thoughts? What would you add to this payload? Anything uh, you'd change or another payload entirely that you'd like to see? Sound off in the comments. And if you're looking for this payload or any of our custom pen test gear, head over to hack5.org. With that, I'm Darren Kitchen. Trust your techno lust. Thanks for supporting Hack5. Find all our shows, community, and pen test products at hack5.org.